Today is Friday. It's the 19th of September. Thank you for being with us. This is Wayne Goldsboro Television. I'm Wayne Alley. And I'm Kim Best. Good Friday morning. Thank you for being with us. Hope you're doing well today. It is the uh, end of the work week for many, and we got a great weekend coming up this weekend. Uh, interesting weather we've had over the last several days. Mm -hmm. Hot, cold, rain, sunshine. You never know when you wake up what we're going to have. Can't keep up with I it. I know. We have a very special program today. Our, our, in place of interview today uh, that we would normally do here in the studio, several months ago I did an interview with a gentleman by the name of Hugh Howard. Mr. Howard was a World War II veteran. He was a, uh, uh, a prisoner, a prisoner of war in Germany during World War II. And we were fortunate enough to uh, ask him and he agreed to sit down and and interview with us and this of course done out at Wayne Community College right. with their facilities out there they did a wonderful job with this and uh, we want to thank Kurt Keller for bringing us all together uh, and uh, we're going to replay the interview with Mr. Hugh Howard uh, who passed away Saturday the uh, Saturday or uh, a couple sixth. weeks ago mm -hmm. the sixth I believe it was who passed away so uh, here's the interview with Mr. Howard In 1923, a family in Moxville, North Carolina, welcomed a new member to their family. They named him Hugh, and he's with us today here in the studio. We want to talk to Mr. Hugh Howard about his life, especially his experiences during World War II. Mr. Howard, thank you for being with us. Glad to be here. All right, tell me, as, uh, tell me about your family. When you, were, when you were from Moxville, which is out uh, west of Winston-Salem, well, we actually lived nine miles out of Moxville toward Winston. Oh, okay. And uh, our farm uh, was a dairy farm. We had about 20 cows that we milked. And it didn't matter when we went to bed at night, we got up at five o'clock in the morning. So that was a must, you know. But anyway, uh, we, uh, I was drafted in 43 off the farm and uh, but uh, I pulled a good one when I got out of high school. What did you do when you got out of high school? A buddy of mine had an uncle that was in uh, Maryland near the Glen L. Martin aircraft factory, and he went up there, and we'd been making a dollar a day f and paying a dollar a day for help, even on the farm. On the farm, and uh. He wrote me a letter about two weeks after he had gone up to his uncle's and he had made 87 cents an hour. And he said, it's a good job, you know. And so I told my dad, I said, I'm going to Baltimore. He said, I can't lose you. He, I said, I, I, I'll pay us. We had bought a new farm tractor and so we had, that was an F-30 farm all. Twelve thousand, twelve hundred and some dollars. Wow! New, a lot of money. Then. And uh, so we uh, uh, we broke rank, and I went to Baltimore, and I began to send a hundred dollars every other week home because I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, we had no money as kids, you know. And so, of course, that helped pay for the tractor. Yeah, it helped with the expenses that, of the farm. That's why I sent it home in order to to be of help, you know. And you know. when was, the, this was, uh, how, how much uh, before uh, December 7th, 1941, what year was this you were talking about at the uh, Martin factory? Uh, it was in um, 42. 42, all right, yeah. so the war was underway. Yeah, yeah. World War II had well, started. I was in high school at that time, and I remember Roosevelt's speech on uh, the 8th in the morning that we declared war because the teacher excused everybody in class and said, just sit still, do whatever you want to do, but don't make any noise. And I stood at a window in the school. And uh, at that time, uh, 
I, I knew the draft was going to get me one way or another because my brother was only about 23 months younger than me, and uh, he didn't pass physical. He had uh, a foot that was injured and everything, so he just he didn't have to go. And I, uh, I in I guess in December of '42, I got my notice from Roosevelt. It said you have been selected. <laughs> well, congratulations. And, yeah, <laughs> and uh, so. At that time, there were about 30 of us who caught a school bus and went to Camp Croft, South Carolina, and we had our physical. Mm -hmm. And so everything looked real good. A sergeant had, had us uh, for the, all the different things, of physicals and everything. Uh, he got on the bus and he said, uh, well, he said, uh, all of you passed but three three out of 30 people. He didn't tell you who, was, who they were or nothing. And we come home not knowing yet today who didn't pass that physical. So everybody stayed on the bus. Uh, yeah. And uh, so then we got a seven day break to get our ducks in a row and then go to Fort Bragg. And that's when the 18th of November, or 18th of February, I had my first active day of military service. In the and U.S. Army? In the U.S. Army then. And uh, they issued me Army clothing and everything. And the next day they took tests. What have you been doing? What's your trade, you know, and things? And I said, well, I've been working in an aircraft factory. Oh, well, you got Army clothes on. You, you're going to Keesler. And they switched me over, and I had to go turn in my clothing and get Air Force clothing, or the uniforms, you know, that the Air Force was using. And at that time, um, I felt real good. I know that I've been selected and go to Kistler for uh, eight weeks. For and, training, and of course, yeah. that's in Biloxi, Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. And you went to, you went to Biloxi, uh, to to train this, and this was a special this was a special yeah. deal for you oh, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just anybody and, could could do and, that. And then I volunteered <clears throat> for gunnery school. I, mm -hmm. I I didn't feel I was uh, pilot qualified or nothing, so I uh, went to gunnery school or put in for it. And uh, they said, well, you got to take a physical. We got to measure you and everything, and they measured me, and I was six foot two. Well, I didn't pass. You didn't pass. Didn't pass. Now, why wouldn't you pass at six foot two? Well, uh, as a gunner, I mean, uh, <laughs> you were too tall. Yeah, too tall. Okay. So uh, we came back to the barracks, and I was, oh man, I was sad that I'd been turned down, and they, we had a barrack chief, little chubby individual, and uh, he he was a PFC, and we hadn't made PFC yet. And uh, he said, uh, I was talking about it, and he said, well, uh, did they take your name? I said, no, I don't think so. Well, he said, you don't have to stand so tall. So <laughs> he showed me how to slump. How to slump. <laughs> And I measured, and I was six footer. Right? Oh boy, we've been looking for guys like you. And <laughs> two days earlier, they'd turned me down, you know. And uh, so you went in as a six footer, yeah, rather than a six and, foot tour. And so when I uh, <laughs> had my physical and everything, and uh, finished the basic training, we got a troop train and a mess kit. And they was cooking in the mess gear, and we eat out of our own can. And uh, guess where I went to? Where did you go? Las Vegas. Oh, that's all that's, the way across country from, no. from Mississippi, across <laughs> what five states, I believe. Now this is in the middle '40s, and Las Vegas was yeah. not the Las Vegas we know today. Oh no, it was a little but, different back then. But it, um, it it had the basic of it a little bit. But nothing compared 
And uh, I went to Las Vegas then in 62, and it was such a change, it was unbelievable then. Now, was that um, the Air Force Base there? Yeah. Was it Nellis? Yeah, Nellis. Nellis, Nellis Air, Air Force. Force. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, <laughs> it's real funny, my wife, when we head to Hoover Dam, she says, I want to get out and look. I said, honey, you don't want to get out. I do. I said, well, okay, if you insist. And she hopped out of the car and about 30 seconds, she was back in the car. She said, the tar that was in those cracks on the road was bubbling. It was 107 degrees. Oh, good gracious. At that August day when we crossed the Hoover Dam. And uh, she wrote back to Germany. Uh, we'd been in France for four years prior to that. And uh, she wrote a letter to some people that we knew and said, pray, whatever you do, don't come to this place of torment. <laughs> so that's, that's how bad it was. So Las Vegas was quite an experience for you. Oh, yes. I mean, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was wild. And all the time that I was in Vegas, I lost two quarters in a slot machine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, now, Mr. Howard, you uh, you mentioned your wife. Yeah. Uh, now, we missed that uh, story, that part of the story. When did you meet her? Where uh, did you meet her? Well, after coming back from overseas, I was sent to Florida, to Miami, and we stayed in a hotel there about three days, and a s tropical st storm came up from uh, down east. And they come in there with a C-47 and flew us, all of those that were POWs, out to Mobile, Alabama, and we stopped and ate. And then they took us to uh, uh, Texas, to San Antonio, and uh, stayed there then for three weeks. My records turned out to be lost in all of those destroyed records that, that people had had. If uh, do you remember the Air Force uh, losing a lot of records and things? Well, mine was in that lost bunch. That was back in the '60s. Yeah. So uh, about um, I guess it was near the end of September. They said you were going to transfer to Scott Air Force Base, and so I went to Scott and. Uh, Two or three of us went to the bowling alley about nine o'clock in the morning. We were bowling, and this lady was uh, waiting on uh, customers' shoes and uh, soda pop and different things. And uh, so uh, I said something. I don't know what it was now that uh, anyway, she almost broke into tears. And I said, well, what's wrong? She said, well, I just got the word about two weeks ago that my husband died on the Bataan Death March in the Philippines, and uh, he got to come home and see his daughter, who was six weeks old, and when he went back, he was gone to the Philippines, and I've never seen him since. In the, uh, uh, a Japanese did not report he was dead, but he died of malaria fever mm -hmm. and was buried in Manila. And so uh, I told her, well, I was a POW in Germany and I lost 51 pounds over there and I haven't got it back yet. And I haven't yet. I've never gained any, any weight or anything uh, you know, to to make up for that. Now, now, when you met your your wife to be, what year was this at the bowling alley? That was in uh, nineteen forty-five. In forty-five, the war was but over. We, yeah, the war was over then mm -hmm. uh, in September. And that's when she had just learned that her yeah, husband had yeah. been had been nearly had three died. years, and uh, so we got to be good friends and. Uh, about six or seven months later, we were man and wife. Wow. <laughs> and uh, 
But she wanted me to come around and meet her daughter, and she was nearly four years old at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the kid always said, uh, can I call him daddy? You know, she won't, um, of course she had no father, you know. And uh, when we got married at, uh, man, I can't even think of the town. It's near Lexington. High Point, I'll get it in a minute. Guilford County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, man that married us married my mom and dad. Really? In 1900, and uh, they, uh, when I, when we uh, come from Illinois uh, to make our plans for a wedding and everything, uh, she just uh, w was pleased, you know, that, and I said, Mom, who did we get to marry us? And she said, uh, the preacher that married us lives in High Point, <laughs> and uh, we went over and set it up, and he was, he was glad to do it. Well, and that? uh, so that's where we got married at then, and uh, we lived together 47 and a half years before she passed away on me. And she died in uh, uh, September the third, I believe it was, of 1993. So, uh, and the daughter? The daughter still lives in Pikeville. Here her in Wayne husband, County. Her husband died two years ago, mm -hmm. and she was married to Osborne Tripp. I don't know if you know, had ever heard that name. He was from Kinston, actually. But uh, what's your daughter's name? Beverly. Beverly Tripp. Yeah. So uh, she's uh, she's getting along pretty good, but uh, she's 77 now. Is she? So that's not, uh, and I'm only 91 myself. Well, <laughs> you're doing pretty good for 91, yeah. I must say. Well, I'm, I'm thankful for it because uh, I've been blessed and uh, just trying to go as regular as I can, you know, and do the things that, uh, that are right. I've, I think I've even practiced eating proper meals and things that a lot of people don't because when I go to the Western Sizzling and see some of the people there that are 300, 350, and uh, they go back to the table with a plate full and a little bit, they go f back with another plate full and then they get a plate full of sweets. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> All right, now, this is the health portion of the program yeah. for today. Uh, so you're helping us to eat healthy. Yeah. All right, now, uh, what, do you, what do you like to eat uh, to stay healthy, well, as, as uh, healthy as you are? I, I like vegetables. We had a garden always, yeah. and uh, we had uh, a variety of uh, different uh, things that are just ordinary, you know, beans, peas, mm. carrots. Uh, I never liked turnips and never liked onions that well. But really? I eat, I eat a lot of them anyway. <laughs> but uh, that's part of, the, uh, part of the thing that I contributed that my, my health. Now, I, I'm from a long li line of livers my uh, dad died at 76, and his sister, baby sister, passed away in 2007, and she was 100 years and 12 days old. My goodness. And uh, Well, my family, I come from a line of long livers, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Howard, as you were uh, stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, how long were you there, and what did you do uh, at Nellis? Nellis, I was training to be a gunner, and this was in 1943. Uh, and uh, everything was pretty fine. Uh, the, it was getting used to the weather, I guess, was the biggest thing in Las Vegas. But anyway, uh, 
I was shipped out of there when I graduated from gunnery school to Amarillo. And Amarillo, then, Texas? Yeah. Right. They made me go to B-17 school. Okay. Well, that turned out to be the best blessing that I had in service because at the war, end of the war, the gunners and bombardiers, a dime a dozen, they had no job. And I had gone through engineer school, 17 weeks of B-17 engineering, and they was crying for me almost, you know, said, you should re-enlist, you know. We'll guarantee you $75 a month flight pay. Wow. And $75 was big money at that time. It was good money in the, in yes. the 40s. Yeah. All right, well, let me ask you now, uh, when you were, how many missions did you fly? I was on my 19th mission when I got shot down. 19th mission, now, yeah. and you were shot down where? Uh, over Cologne. And you were in a B-17? B-17. I was the top gunner, and myself, and the co-pilot and the pilot were all in the cockpit. The uh, navigator and bombardier were in the nose section, and then the radio operator was next in the back on the other side of the bomb uh, load that we had bombs in the bomb bay. And then there was a, a waste gunner and a tail gunner, and my tail gunner was a uh, we called him Cass. His, niz his name was Kazmir Aloysius Sidlowski. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, so, Aloysius, yeah. So yeah. We, uh, we shortened his name for him. At, at that. But anyway, I went, went to Las Vegas uh, and then to Amarillo. And when I graduated from school, they gave us our first leave. And so... Uh, we caught a Greyhound bus that had the engine out in front across Oklahoma and Arkansas, and we had to change the bus in, uh, I guess it was Memphis. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it took us three days and nights traveling from uh, Amarillo to North Carolina. To get home. And then it took three days and three nights to get back. So. Out of a 15-day leave, we traveled six days. And uh, so from there, I was sent to uh, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and that's where we formed the combat crews. They had selections of everybody, and it turned out there were 10 on the crew then. They had two waste gunners. But during the war, uh, the formation flying and everything was so close till that one gunner, don't matter which side he was on, he couldn't use his gun because it'd be firing into other airplanes. Right. And so they, they turned him in and uh, he was transferred to the Army out of the Air Corps. And I never knew where, he was from Kentucky. I was from North Carolina. My pilot was from Alabama, co-pilot, uh, Arkansas, and uh, one of the boys was from uh, Utah and one from uh, Nebraska. They were from all and, over the country. Uh, all over, uh, and, uh, how they got them so mixed like that, I mean, it was a mystery. Oftentimes, the military would try to put people together from the same parts of the country. Well, I, it changed. It didn't happen, did it? No. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, Let's move along to uh, to uh, your 19th mission. Yeah. Where where had all your other missions been? Also over Germany, or where well, were they? My first mission was a nine-hour and 35-minute flight time to Pinamundi, which is up on the Baltic Sea, but near to Latvia and Estonia those six European countries that's on the Baltic Sea. And uh, we were not accosted by any fighters at that time. We, we expected it, but uh, I don't know why we weren't. But uh, anyway, we got back with, without losing any airplanes. And uh, my next mission then was 
uh, and France. Uh, we had a lot of uh, ships and everything that the Germans had parked in the Straits of uh, France for their protection. But anyway, from there and then to uh, Belgium, to Holland, back to uh, Austria, and uh, just uh, a number of places, but uh, some of them I couldn't pronounce if I wanted to. They were <laughs> German names, you know. And so your 19th mission over Cologne, your plane was hit. Yeah. How much, how, how damaged was your plane? Well, they got a hit of shrapnel and it made a hole in the propeller dome. Right. And the, all the oil was squirting out of the dome. And as soon as it was empty, the thing kept windmilling and they didn't have a chance to cut it off because it, it, uh, it was controlled by the oil. And uh, engine number three got hit in the back end of it and got on fire. And that's when I decided uh, it's time to go. <laughs> time to go, time yeah. to leave the plane. And so I'm uh, uh, in the uh, position that I'm in if you could see the pilot on this side looking forward, co-pilot here, and I was right here in less than 36 inches from them. So you were right behind the pilot yeah, and the co-pilot. Yeah. How mm -hmm. high was the plane, do you recall? 27,000. 27,000 feet, yeah, that's, that's rather high. about five miles high. Almost five miles, yeah. And 44 below zero. And that, that, that's cool weather. So you decided to and, jump in well, those conditions? Well, it, 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 there was no choice. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, I'd seen airplanes on fire blow up, I mean, in hundreds of pieces, and the bodies hanging out there, you know. So that was, of course, the fear of this yeah, happening. Yeah, So uh, I... Uh, I got on the ground probably 12 or 15 minutes later from the time I jumped out that I'd come down the five mile stretch. And uh, it uh, it was something that you, you'd scared to do it, but you got to do it to live. What were your feelings when you were, did you, did you well, free fall or did you pull your chute immediately? Well, no. I, I was behind number two engine. If if you could see this as the nose of the airplane, the bombardier here and the navigator here, there's a navigator table here, and then the pilot here, co-pilot, and then me. Well, that window t to bail out was here, and about 18 inches behind that was where that propeller blade was turning. And uh, so when you, when you made a decision to bail, you didn't reach up and try to get the propeller, I mean, because it cut your hand off. Right. And uh, so that's what I did. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I can feel myself tumbling uh, after it happened, you know, because she was in the air but I don't know just how high I was, but I, I would estimate about 10,000 feet when I pulled a cord. And, and it was I, cold. And I, oh yeah, it was 44 below zero, uh, the outside temperature on the airplane. My goodness. And uh, so we, a uh, uh, lot of us had heavy shoes on and uh, socks, garments for protection and that's about about all you could do I mean it's so uh, mr. Howard as you were tumbling your parachute was open you were coming down it was cold uh, you came down about 10,000 feet uh, after your chute opened yeah you hit the ground where did you land uh, in a bush and one of the bushes on the hedgerow there and it was like uh, maybe three or four feet tall 
and I got scratched legs and things from hitting it. But as soon as I got on the ground, I began to cut the cords off of my parachute and buried it so they wouldn't find it. Now, what time of the day was this? This was about, uh, I would say, 10, pretty close to 10 o'clock in the morning. So it was See? daylight, and oh, there yeah. you were, wide open. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you landed near a hedgerow or near bushes. Yeah. You buried your chute, and then what? Well, that's when I tried to figure out if I could swim the river. The Rhine River was between me and the main part of Cologne. And, uh, well, we had 300 airplanes that morning in our formation. And it about a, a three, three and a half tons per airplane. Mm. You can imagine how the ground would shake. Well, it wasn't but about, uh, oh, less than 10 minutes, another segment of airplanes came through and they salvoed their bombs. And if you don't think you get the message, you, you I mean, it, it was just unbelievable. And then you find out what it's like to be on the other end of a bomb going off. And, uh, but anyway, the sergeant captured me then and, uh, a German sergeant. Ger yeah. And, uh, they took me to a hog pen. It, it was muddy and dirty and all. It was just like a hog pen. Why did they take you and, to a hog pen? Well, to hold and uh, put me in it to hold. Okay. And then they, uh, they got two or three more POWs in that they'd captured and they, they uh, but on myself, they knew, they knew where I had been bombing or where all of that thing was. And they had a lieutenant in the back seat of a Jeep with me and a guy in the right seat with a gun and a driver in the left seat. All right, now and were you the only one captured? These yeah, were all German uh, soldiers. Yeah, well, okay. and that's, I was the only one with that group. Right. But anyway, they gave me a tour, about 30 minute drive through Cologne <laughs> Every time they would see a building, you could look up in some of those buildings, four, five stores high, and you could see all the way to the ground. The walls was missing. The damage yeah, caused damage, by, the, damage. by the bombs. And so that's when they wanted me to see. And uh, if, if there was something that he thinks I, I ought to see, he would run, run me in the side. <laughs> you know, and pointed out, mm -hmm. and uh, that was part of the uh, the education that I received. You know, from from uh, being obedient because I, I sure didn't want to get shot. Well, now, when where did you where did they end up taking you, and what happened when they got when you well, got there? We uh, we were taken about five miles east of Cologne to an airfield, and about that was about four o'clock in the afternoon and uh, the sergeant that was in charge of us then turned us over to a guy on base and they took us to the chai hall and uh, when we would get to the chai hall there was at least uh, 10 or 12 Americans in that chai hall that had already been rounded up you know that got shot down. Okay, okay. hold on. They gave us a bowl Sorry. of soup and a piece of dark bread. I mean, that's that's all the bread they'd have um, most of the time. Now this was late in the war. Uh, uh, well, it was in October of 43? 44. 44. Yeah. October 44. It was late in the war, and the Germans were pretty much on the run. They well, were having a hard time with well, food, were they not? It was uh, it was before the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, so we. Uh, uh, completed, they turned me in and uh, got the bowl of soup and things. And then when it got dark, we was put in a dump truck. There were about 10 or 12 of us in the dump truck with a German guard. And uh, we drove to Bonn, which was nearly 30 miles 
south of Cologne. And uh, I, I, I wondered why we drove in that truck. But come to find out, the railroad tracks had been bombed by the Americans, and there wasn't no train that could have ride in them. But that's where we caught the train to, and rode all night to Frankfurt for, for the next morning. And uh, so we, uh, we had a pretty good trip there. I had a man laying on my leg. He didn't. He was injured and had his head. I, I didn't see his face at all, but he had uh, he had got injured. And uh, so when we got to Frankfurt, the civilians come out, and they wanted to spit on us and everything else when they saw we were POWs because of the bombings and things that had happened. And uh, we went to uh, Wetzlar about, uh, I guess it's it's about 20 kilometers or something, about 12 miles from Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we were processed in again. And from there, two days later, I was put on a train and sent to uh, uh, Stalag Luft 4. And that's between Stettin and Danzig on the Baltic Sea. All right. Well, now, where, at what point did they, and I know they had to question you about uh, things. Where did they question you, and, and well, how did they go about it? That was in the POW camp at uh, Wetzlar. And uh, that's when the sergeant uh, said, how tall are you? How much do you weigh? And different things, because mm -hmm. I wasn't talking. And he thought he would get me to talk in somewhere. And so he was asking you simple questions. Yeah, yeah. But I, we were told name, rank, and serial number, and that was it. You couldn't give any more and information. I, no. That's right. And I wasn't, wasn't given it. <laughs> but uh, it was one of those things that you just, uh, uh, you, you have a hard understanding of how it all worked out. But... Uh, they didn't hit me or didn't mistreat me or anything that I could complain about. So, uh, but in a little bit, they uh, run me out and uh, they got another one in because they were in, in line, you know, for questioning. So now, at, at, at later on, they sent you to Stalag, to another Stalag? Stal now, this was a transit camp we I were see. in there. Okay. And then to Luft 4 was uh, between Stettin and Danzig. Right. And we were there the uh, rest of November and December till the 25th of January, which was nearly three months. But one morning, or one evening rather, about, I guess it's sundown maybe, we begin to hear boom, 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 boom. And the Germans, man, they were running around in the, and uh, turned out it was the Russians coming from uh, uh, Pol Eastern Poland right. into where we were. And uh, next morning, they, they pulled about 50 railroad cars in and put 60 men in each one of them. And they, they had a waste bucket for 60 people in one car. And, right. and if you can imagine the smell, uh, it, it was something else. But anyway, uh, they got all the injured people that they could get on the first train. They, there was four compounds in that camp. We had A, B, C, and D. And I was in B compound, and uh, it was in northwest corner of the camp, and they pulled us out the second day, and we went. We uh, we didn't move till night, but anyway, the train started to Berlin from from. Uh, we'll say this is Pinamundi, the uh, the uh, water area, and here. And then here's Berlin. Well, we got about 20 miles of Berlin, and uh, it was four o'clock in the morning. 
so uh, most of the guys uh, that could was laying down, but about 15 had to stand up all the time. I mean, there that, that wasn't that much space on that boxcar. And uh, that morning, about 7 o'clock, the guard said, Sargi, bucket. And he made him go empty the waste bucket. Oh, boy that everybody had been using. And uh, when he did that, he, uh, he come running back and he said, guess what? There's no engines on the train. They had pulled them off to make another trip. And we sat there three days and nights, no food, no water, and nothing else. My goodness. So, Mr. Howard, you were without food for three days, and you were stuck there with no way of transportation. Yeah. You were all stuck there in that train, those train cars. Yeah. What, uh, ha has this had any effect on you in later years, going without the food, being stuck there on that train track? I, I don't think so. I, from that standpoint, as soon as I got a good meal, I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> But now, when we uh, when they started moving that train, it was about three days or and a half after we had been sitting, and uh, it took eleven days to get to Nuremberg from the prison camp where we were moved out of, and so we were there two months at Nuremberg, and the people was very bitter there too. And uh, we, uh, about, I guess it was in the second month uh, after that, we were, the uh, Americans broke through on the Western Front. Right. And it was boom, boom, boom again. And that made the Germans real happy. Uh, it, it, you know, they just went wild, really. And they put us in 75 to a, a a group. They put a guard on this end and a guard on this end in front, and we started marching, and we marched for two weeks toward Munich, and we wound up at Stalag 7A in that. I was only there four or five days, but the only thing that I met was some British soldiers who were captured at Dunkirk in 1949 and and uh, 40 and 41. 40 and 41, right. Yeah. And uh, they um, they said, Sarge, American airplanes not made from wood? I said, no, they're metal. They never seen them because the British airplanes were made out of wood that were in the 30s, you know. Talking about the Mosquito and yeah, that, that, yeah, those planes? Yeah. yeah. Well, they didn't know if any of their, their own airplanes mm -hmm. had metal even. They mm -hmm. thought there was all balsam wood, you know. Yeah. So uh, where, where were you? Did you stay as a prisoner of war until the end of the war? Yeah. Uh, we were liberated the 29th of April. And where were 40, you? 45, and I was in Stalag, Luft 7. Luft 7. And... Uh, we had about 15 different nationalities of people in that camp. There was probably 40,000 people. And uh, the colonel that was in charge of the camp uh, asked all the Americans to s stand aside and not try to get shipped out today because we got so many foreign people and I want to get them out first. And they did, that's what they did. So we were, out, we were liberated the 29th of April, but we got out of the camp about the 7th of May. And then from there, we were put on a goonie bird and flew to, Rhine, uh, to Rhine, uh, Reims, France. France yeah. And then we went through the de program. They had us to strip, put your clothes in that pile over there, and I'm sure they burned them from there because of the insects. I mean, 
everybody there had blood spots on their clothing because they'd had fleas and things that would bite and uh, draw the blood. And from there, how long were you in service beyond that point? Uh, well, I went to uh, Camp Lucky Strike from there after I got my uniform and everything. And there's a B-17 landed at that airstrip at the uh, base. And uh, I went running out to it. And the co-pilot was George Gaines, who had been in the same group that we were sent overseas with. But he had got a, a, a hearing problem or something other than had, He'd been grounded for about two months. And uh, when he got out, I seen him and said, hello, George. And he come running over and says, uh, do you want to go back to England? I said, yeah. <laughs> I got on that airplane and went to England. I didn't ask anybody. When they come back and uh, flew the B-17 back to Cambridge, where we were at Bassingbourne, we were in the 91st bomb group, Triangle A on the tails. And that's where uh, he was in one of those airplanes. All right, and, very good. All right, Mr. Howard, in the remaining seconds we have, first of all, let me thank you for your service to our nation. Well, Is there anything you'd like our, our audience to know? Well, uh, this, this is kind of tied up with people. But anyway, I stayed in London or stayed in the air base about four or five days uh, after we flew back out of France. And then I went to London and stayed about four or five more days. And I got tired and I went to uh, Southampton and uh, registered and they put us on a ship. And so, uh, the big sergeant that was in charge of the, the loading said, does it, we have any volunteers to work? He said, we've got a lot of, a lot of work here on the ship. And uh, nobody answered him. So finally he says, how would you like to make a tour of the ship? And we all <laughs> fell in. <laughs> 2,200 people, some, arms broken, oh, legs my. broken, and all of that, and they had to be fed. And when they got back, he said, has anybody changed their mind about working? And everybody in that POW group volunteered for a job. And I wound up in the meat market, uh, dethawing the uh, hams or whatever it was, chickens, and uh, the chickens, at that time, the government put them up whole, quick freeze, and the guts and things were still in them. Oh my. And uh, we had to let, let them lay overnight, mm -hmm. and they would soften up before we could fix them. Right. And so that's where we went to from there. And so I got home about uh, the 28th of May, I think it was, of 45. and. Uh, uh, and we went to Camp Shanks, New York, and uh, once they got us there, they turned us loose as soon as we were ready. An American hero, Mr. Hugh Howard, uh, thank you again for your service to our country. Well, thank you for speaking with us today. I'm glad to do it because uh, a lot of people I know don't know the details, and uh, I'm not bothered with it's over. So that's, that's the way I feel about it. And I'm still thankful to be alive yet today. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Okay, thank you. That is our program. I, I, I do hope you enjoy that. Mr. Howard was a wonderful man, of course, an American hero. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do uh, thank uh, you for 
uh, watching this particular program. It's a very special program with Mr. Howard. And thank you for interviewing him. You know, we want to celebrate the life and, and, and all that he did yes, along indeed. with all our veterans. Yes, indeed. And I guess that's going to wrap it up for I today. I believe it is, yeah. All right. Well, have a great weekend. We'll be back in here again Monday morning, same time. Same place. And until then, I'm Wayne Alley. And I'm Kim Best. And this is what's happening in your community.